All right, welcome. We're going to get started here, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us live in diretta from our kitchen here in Piovico, Italy, to your kitchen or living room at home. This is great, and unlike any other cooking class you've uh, ever been a part of, because uh, we are transforming, transporting you here to uh, Piovico, Italy, and you can communicate with us throughout the class by, via the chat box on your right. Um, anytime during the class you'd like me to repeat something or go, go, into, um, go more in depth in something or uh, uh, explain it a little more, whatever, just go ahead and shoot a message to Ashley and she'll stop me and uh, let me know what I need to do. So uh, today we have a great menu. We have Italian comfort food today. And these are three things that we definitely have during the winter uh, more, than, more, than, more than not so often. And uh, the three dishes today, Vedore Gratinato, baked vegetables in the oven. Um, very, very classic all over the place around here. La Moretto or Cafe Farnese is something you'll only find really right around Fano uh, to keep you warm and to help the fishermen have the energy to go out in the sea in uh, the wintertime. And Pasta alla Nortina, um, a, something from Nor uh, Pasta alla Nortina from Norcia, for, which, is, which is named after a Norcino. So say that three times fast. Pasta alla Norcia is named after Nor uh, Norcino is named after Norcia, a little tiny town right uh, on the border of Umbria and Marche, a little bit south of us. And they're famous for their Norcino, which is another name for a pig, pig butcher. Um, before we get started here, we got two cameras today. Uh, we have the big wide shot that you're seeing me now, and we also have this wonderfully homemade um, camera, camera right here that, you can, that Ashley can switch to. Also, you'll notice in the background here my pot with a uh, pan on top of it. And this is an old habit from working in kitchens where you never find the lids to pots. So you just grab a pan and put it on there. So my water is all boiled and ready to go. And the first thing we're going to start out with is the one that's going to take the most time, and that is the Vidori Gratinata. So for this one, you can use whatever. If, you, if we were doing this in June, July-ish, it'd be all zucchini. Um, if I was doing it in, the, in September, it'd be all peppers. Uh, if, if we were really doing this for me, for myself and Ashley, it would be all onions because uh, I use what I have. But we'll use, even though zucchini definitely not in season, peppers, just giant pepper from Sicily is definitely not in season there, hot house. Uh, these onions are mine. Use whatever vegetables you want. Car um, onions, uh, peppers, zucchini, you can use um, uh, aubergine or eggplant or melanzane, wherever you're from, whatever you call it. Uh, tomatoes, cut, whack the top off of a nice big tomato and do the same thing we're going to do here. Works out perfectly as well. All right, how to prep them out. You ready? Okay. Here, how to prep them out. First thing we'll do is the pepper. Now, this guy, quick, easy way to clean the pepper. You got me on this one? All right. Yep. Okay. Top off, clean the pepper, easy way. Top off. Flip it around, bottom off. Put them on its side, take one cut straight down. It's easier to do this with a pepper that's a nice uniform uh, size. And then put your knife in, and in a sawing motion, open the package. And it should just all come out. And of course, you have your waste bucket on the left, or waste bowl. OK, so we want to get rid of all of these white parts, of course. Okay, and now just cut it into what you would think of as manageable strips. And I'm going to go ahead and set that on a piece of part on a parchment-lined cookie sheet or baking sheet. Next one we're going to do the zucchini. These zucchini, depending on how big they are and what time of the year it is, I'll sometimes cut out the um, the centers or scoop out the centers. And what I mean by that is most of the liquid is held inside of the seed bed right here. And sometimes it's just too much. The breadcrumbs will never get crunchy if there's too much seeds and stuff. And these are not, I mean, they're hothouse, so they're not going to have the flavor that mine do. So all I'm going to do is, real quick, run a little spoon through them. And that's it. I'll set those in the middle. Can I talk about parchment paper? Absolutely. I love parchment paper. I love parchment paper because you can use it for anything. It's a lid. It's a... Um, it's a um, pastry bag in a pinch when you don't have one. 
It's to line, um, it lines uh, the cookie sheets beautifully. You can use it for, in papillote, in, in the paper for the fish. The reason I like parchment paper over foil is nothing sticks to parchment. Foil is horrible. Things stick to foil. Foil is more expensive. Um, I hate cleaning pans, so that's why I use parchment paper. <laughs> so when you lay the parchment down, you just throw the parchment away, give the pan a quick wipe with hot soapy water, and you're done. Uh, whereas if we were doing this with, um, if I just did this with, uh, oh, right on the pan, I would have to scrub the pan off. So the, back to cutting veggies. These are a little bit big. Look at how big these guys are. So I'm going to just cut them in half. It'll be easier, much easier to manage. All right, right there in the middle. That's plenty. Okay, last one. Onion. We want to cut this onion to be nice thick slices, like you were doing onion rings or something. But an onion is a, veg a round vegetable. And we talked about last class about how you want to be really careful when you cut a round vegetable. Because when I go to cut this, see how it wants to roll on me? And that's a great way to cut your finger off. It can and will happen. You will you'll learn that very quickly as soon as you cut yourself really well. So how do we avoid this from happening? Well, let me show you as soon as I get this onion skin off. Okay, we're going to cut a little, um, we're just going to cut a little slice off the bottom to give us a nice flat surface. So, if you want to go ahead, you got me in the shot. Okay, so all I'm going to do, cut a little, little piece off the edge. Now I have a beautiful surface that will stand right up. So I want to cut nice, thick slices. See how I'm going down and forward? Down and forward. Woo! See, that's what I want to avoid. So when you go down and forward, it's a lot easier to, it's, you, that will happen much less than if you just go straight down with your knife. All right. So I'll line these guys up. Oh, that's a little bit too much. There we go. All right. Here we go. So you're, you, are you where I am? Your parchment paper's down. You got your veggies. I'm just doing a couple of each. Like I said, if I was just doing this for me and Ash, it'd be all onions. It's my favorite part. They're the best onion rings you'll ever, ever, ever have, I promise. Okay, olive oil. Put your finger over the top of the bottle if you have a bottle and you don't have a pretty pour like I do. Not a ton, just enough to get the, just enough to get the breadcrumbs to stick. I know I'm getting in my own shot. Okay, there we go. Next, pinch of salt. When you... When you do salt, if you do a high hand, salt, if you do a high hand, salt is more spread out. If you go with your hand low, it's more concentrated. So depending on what you want to do, I'm going to use a nice high hand so it goes everywhere. If I was using tomatoes, I would whack the top third off the tomato and stick them wherever you want to stick them. If you're using eggplant or aubergine, same exact thing. The vegetables do not matter. It's whatever you like. You will be, if you get into doing this one, this will be your dish. This will be your thing. Like uh, my grandma made cornflake chicken, and we call it grandma chicken. This, is, this will be your thing. Okay, a little crack of pepper. All right, and those are ready. If you want to put any other spices or seasonings or whatever, it's totally up to you. All right, next thing, breadcrumbs. Not all breadcrumbs are created equally. There's two types of breadcrumbs. The ones that feel like, um, like sawdust, really, and those with a little bit more texture to them. You can get the, you can find the, te the ones with more texture, but they're not going to be on the grocery store shelves. Remember, it's all about the little things in these, ingre in these recipes. It's all about getting the best possible ingredients you can find. So the breadcrumbs do make a difference. There's only two things. It's vegetables and breadcrumbs. So if one of those stinks, it's gonna, your dish isn't going to be great. So these are what I'm talking about with the regular breadcrumbs. And they're just kind of, they're very finely ground, they're very dry, and they look kind of like um, sawdust. These ones, uh, these ones, great English. <laughs> this, this one here, um, they are fresh bread crumbs, meaning it's just stale bread that they, that they put through the same grinder that um, grinds the Parmesan. And you can see the difference in the textures. There's a huge difference. Okay? This one's more along the lines, if you can't find breadcrumbs like this, try panko. Not, J not Japanese breadcrumbs, panko, not Italian at all, but they have much more texture to them with the breadcrumbs. If you, all you have today is the kind of um, 
fine grinded um, um, kind of sawdust ones. Say la vie for the next time you learn. I'll use the sawdust ones. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Why? Because I, I, I don't have any more of these. Okay. So a little bit of chopped herbs, whatever you like. Parsley, sage, thyme. It doesn't matter. If you want to add something else to the uh, breadcrumbs, some um, kind of ground up chili or whatever, I don't care. Totally up to you. And it's not a ton either. I'm not putting three handfuls of bread or of chopped herbs into this. All right, so far so good. Not too dif difficult at all. We'll come back to our, just going to mix it up a little bit. Now, for the breadcrumbs, we want to cover the breadcrumb. We want to cover the vegetables nicely, but we don't want, you know, two fingers thick of breadcrumbs. It's not uh, breadcrumbs with vegetables. It's vegetables with breadcrumbs. So. My favorite part now will be the part, the breadcrumbs, my favorite part will be the breadcrumbs that get in between the uh, vegetables and uh, they'll get really crunchy. So you can see just to cover and then just to cover. And the oil is going to help the breadcrumbs to stick. All right. Obviously, if you had more veggies, you'd use up more breadcrumbs. Okay, to finish it, before it goes into the oven, another little drizzle of olive oil, tiny, tiny bit, much less than you did the last time. This is just to give the little bit of breadcrumbs a little bit of oil so they'll brown up. Now, my breadcrumbs have no salt in them because there's no salt in the bread in our area. So I give mine a tiny bit of salt for the breadcrumbs. But since you probably have bread that has salt in it, you can remove that step. This is going to go into a 300 degree, 180 degree, or 180 degree centigrade oven for about 45 minutes to almost an hour, depending on how thick your vegetables are, how packed in you put your uh, vegetables into the pan. And this, more than anything else, will show whether your oven is uh, at the correct temperature, meaning if your thermostat is correct. So we talked about this a couple of classes ago, getting a cheap oven thermometer to make sure that 350 degrees is really 350 degrees, because I know with my oven, I'm 20 degrees uh, uh, um, slow. So I have to turn mine up 20 degrees extra to come up to the proper temperature. So we'll, set this, we'll put this in. We'll set this for eh, 25, 30 minutes. We'll give a check after that. All right? The duri gratinata. This goes with anything. Warm, cold. You can make a sandwich the next day with just that and some, like, uh, I put arugula because we have it from the garden. Uh, it goes with grilled meats. It goes with roasted meats. It goes with uh, other vegetables. It's, it's absolutely one of my favorites. All right, timer, 25 minutes. Any questions? Go ahead and type them in now. Not, I mean, we're not curing cancer. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're just making baked vegetables. But it's simple and absolutely delicious. So a couple of things to remember. Cut your onions nice and thick. Don't cut your hand off. Make, if you need to, scoop out some of the seed bed from the zucchini or from the eggplant or aubergine, a um, little drizzle of olive oil, then salt and pepper. Breadcrumbs, whether you get the nice ones with texture or the ones that are a little bit finer grind, and then a little bit of olive oil over the top. Those will go in, 350, 180. And I'll, after 25, 30 minutes, I'll give them a turn. And then maybe the last 10 minutes or so, I'll flip the, uh, flip the fan on. I have a convection fan in my oven to get them nice and brown. Or you can turn the grill or the boiler on. Ashley, hit me. Excellent question. Does it matter if for tomatoes if the pan, which have a lot more humidity in them, for them not to get soggy? The tomatoes won't get crispy. The vegetables that border it will tend to get not get as crispy if the tomatoes kind of run out. But in my experience, it's, that makes some of the best <laughs> crunchy, because um, the tomato dries up and the tomato has a lot of sugar, and then those breadcrumbs that are around the tomato get nice and crunchy and they're really good. So yes, it does. If you had a whole pan of tomatoes, it might take longer, but Normally, on a pan that size, I'll have two or three tomatoes, and it gives a little bit more humidity to the pan. It might take 10 more minutes for the vegetables to cook, but otherwise, it'll be totally fine. Anyone else? Speak now. All right. Veggies are in the oven. I'm going to take two minutes and clean up. We're going to switch it over to Ashley, and um, she's going to tell you what's going on and what we have cooking. Go ahead and clean up your station. The next thing we're going to be doing is the um, moretto, or the uh, uh, cafe panese. And um, 
So you'll need your liquors, your mocha if you're going to do it, or if you're just going to watch along, pull, refill your cup with whatever you're enjoying. All right, see you in two. Um, if you want, you can make your coffee now. Thank you very much. Good job, Ashley. If you want, while Ashley's yapping, make your coffee. Oh, why don't you brush the vegetables? Why don't I brush the vegetables with olive oil instead of drizzling over them? That's an excellent question. If you'd like to brush the vegetables with olive oil, how about it? I just have a can, and it's a lot easier for me to just drizzle than get out a paintbrush and brush them. But you achieve the same purpose. You actually probably get the oil to uh, extend itself a little bit out further. So you don't have any pool, pools of oil. That's what you really want to avoid. Don't get a big puddle of oil on the top. It's really just a little drizzle. And that's why this can is so great. It just really puts out a, a tiny drizzle. And why, are we doing the coffee? why are we doing the coffee out of order? Excellent question. We're doing the coffee out of order to kill time because my, the baked vegetables will take basically an hour. The pasta and the sauce, I can have the pasta sauce done in the time it takes for you to boil the pasta. So we'll have a coffee. It's a, it's, it's a real life, baby. This is how it really goes. So um, this, of course, you would serve the coffee at the end of the meal. But um, otherwise, I'm going to have to sit here and dance and fill time for like 25 minutes. And you don't want that much of me. We'll, we'll do the coffee, and then you, we'll, you can do it again at the end if you want. All right? Sorry. That's how it goes. Welcome to my side of the room um, on the other side of the camera slash computer answering your questions and hopefully you guys are enjoying. I'd love to know who's cooking and who's just watching. We've got viewers from all across the globe, from London to Seattle to New York and all the way up in Canada, Montreal and Toronto. It's wonderful. It's uh, really a small world out here in teeny tiny Piovico, that's for sure. It just cracks us up. Um, I hope the feed is coming in well. Some people were asking us um, about doing other time slots, but this seems to be the best time in Italy for the feed to be coming through nice and strong, or at least the strongest we hope it can. Um, so what do we have going on? I thought I would start my little um, intermission segments with some serious breaking news, folks. I know in America, um, when is Groundhog's Day, Jay? Sometime in February. In February is Groundhog's Day. A little groundhog pops his head up through the tear, uh, through the tear, <laughs> through the ground, looks around, and if he finds his shadow or not, it depends on if it's an early spring or not, and the forecast for the year. Well, here in lovely La Marque, we do things a little bit different. We read onions, and this just cracks me up because I feel like this is just again so Italian. Everything has to do with food and even the weather. And the weather is always so important for a farmer. You know, how's the crop? Is it too wet? Um, is it too dry? But to know that an onion will predict the season cracks me up. And for those of you who have been waiting with a bated breath to find out what the onion skins will read, we got a good year coming. <laughs> Early springs, April, it's supposed to be just spectacular. And a gorgeous August and into September, so says the onions. So um, maybe we'll start reading our own onions. I'm not sure if they would tell the same story as the ones in Urbania. But um, I just think it's hysterical. And it also, again, shows how regional things are. We were talking to a friend of ours in southern Italy who he lives where does Lorenzo live? Um, Bari. In, in Bari. And he started cracking up and said he'd never heard of this. And he had no idea that onions could tell the, the weather. So uh, just a little something, some breaking news from our corner of the world. And I think Jason is ready. Are you ready, babe? Um, yeah, I'm just plug back in. All right, just plugging his mic back in, and you will see my smiling face again shortly. One sec. Okay. All right. La Moretta, Cafe Fanese. This is super duper local. You will not find this anywhere outside of Fano. In fact, people from our area in Piobico know, oh, yeah, that's the coffee of Fano. Um, the La Moretta, or uh, Café Farnese, is a fisherman was, in, was really um, invented at the seaside with the fishermen. Um, they needed something strong with sugar and a little bit of booze to keep them warm and give them energy to continue to uh, uh, go out into the cold during the winter months. Um, La Moretta is really easy to make. Most people make a little their own concoction at home. Three main ingredients to La Moretta, and that is uh, brandy in equal parts, by the way. Brandy, rum and either sambuca or anise. Or anise. And um, some people put a little bit more of one or a little bit of less of another. That's, that's just their personal preferences. 
um, our good friend uh, Tonino, he makes a he makes a mean uh, Moretta, puts it in these beautiful bottles, and gives it away for Christmas gifts, which is absolutely great. So to make uh, Moretta at home, if you didn't have the um, the steam machine from the um, ca cappuccino machine to froth up your, or to heat up your liquor, if you did, you pour just a little bit of this in however much you want a finger, let's say, into this, and you would heat up the liquor with the steam. All right, but I don't have one of those. So what do I have? I have a little stainless steel, a little stainless steel uh, milk pumper actually, with a little ramekin that I'll put at the bottom. This way, uh, the um, glass won't touch the bottom of the thin stainless steel. And I'm going to put this over on the fire and heat it up. I know you can't see because my bottles are in the way. So I'll get my bottles out of the way. All right, so we'll heat that guy up. Now, why can't you just throw it into a pan and heat it up? Well, if you just throw it into a pan or a pot and heat it up, the edges will start to um, come to a boil first. Now you're cooking off all your alcohol. So really, we just want to heat it up. Poor man's double boiler, just kind of, a, you rig it. You, you use what you got, right? Um, next thing, a little bit of lemon zest. Just a peel of lemon, and we'll put it in the bottom of the glasses. And this is something fun to do if you have a dinner party or something. It's something to talk about, oh, Moretta Fanese, and, and um, it's just something a little different than just a cafe. Which, which reminds me, cafe in coffee in Italy is so much more than just what we think of just coffee. There are so many different types. There is uh, cafe lungo, long coffee, cafe stretto, short coffee, cafe uh, macchiato, cafe mocha, or uh, ca cafe cappuccio, or cappuccino. Um, there's also cafe universitario, which is, uh, we just learned about this the other day. When the um, university students study for their exams, They'll make normal pot of coffee in the mocha, just like this, and, and then they will take the coffee out, replace the, in where the water goes, pour the coffee they just made in there, put new coffee in the basket, and brew it again. So you brew it twice over, and that's supposed to be giving you the uh, strength and a good jolt to be able to study for exams. Um, speaking of coffee machines, the best $25 euros you will ever spend is a cafe mocha. This is a cafe mocha. They come in lots of different sizes. This is six cup. That's three cup. There's uh, 12 cups, big 16 cups. This is how most people in Italy make coffee. And I will take the Pepsi challenge with your $1,000 plus machine any day of the week, cafe mocha with a uh, milk pumper, and I'll make a cappuccino that you probably pay a lot of money for. 25 bucks, and the milk pumper's maybe eight. Um, if you're interested in more about how to use this machine, how to clean it, how to care for it, Ashley made a really great little video, um, and she's going to put it up there, put a link for it, so after you're done, you can watch it. But this is great. They sell all these parts separately. So the top, you can buy a part, the, the handle, the little basket inside, they sell separately, so you'll have it for life. What kind of coffee do you use? Well, there are tons of different kinds of coffee in Italy, of course. I love, and I think is the best, is Lavazza Cafe Oro, and this is um, the gold package. They in the States, you'll find three times. You'll find the uh, red Cafe Rosso, you'll find the um, 1869 or whatever, and then you'll find this one. This is the most expensive, and uh, it's the best. It's 100% Ar Arabica, whatever. Arabi Arabica, Arabica beans, whatever. It's, we've tried them all, and this is the good one. So if you want a great present for someone who loves coffee in your life, get them a mocha, a milk frother, and a kilo of Cafe Oro, and you'll be set. All right, let's see how my coffee is doing. Beautiful, brewing nicely. That's warming beautifully. I have my two glasses. Oh, yeah, Cafe Coretto. So what's a Cafe Coretto? A Cafe Coretto really means a corrected coffee, and that's a coffee with a shot of either uh, grappa, sambuca, anisette, whatever they want. But only in Italy do you correct coffee with a shot of liquor in it. All right, sugar as you like it. Okay. Ooh, that's nice and hot. I'll turn that off. Okay. We'll put a little finger. Oh, that that one has a lot more than a that has a big boy finger. All right, that'll be mine. Okay, we stir up the sugar and the lemon and the liquor to make sure everything's mixed up. All right, 
Now, your coffee is percolating. It's all done. Very important. When, you, when, this, when this is done, done, you'll hear it. It'll start percolating. When it's done, shut the heat off, and this is very, very important because the coffee that was brewed first is the strongest. It came up the slowest in the first pass through the, through the grinds. The stuff that came up at the end came through the quickest and has the least concentration, right? So what we have to do is give it a stir. Otherwise, the first coffee you pour off will be weak and the last one will be muddy. All right, very good. Now, now to do this, very important, we, don't, we want to keep layers of the liquor and coffee separate. So how do we do that? You take your little Demitasse spoon and you pour the coffee over the spoon. Nope, I didn't do it right. It mixed. See that? So, it want, so you want the coffee to hit the spoon first so it doesn't mix itself up with the liquor. But mine mixed up. And that it, there it is, Cafe Moretta. And this is really good. This is good. Here you go, my Aschmeister. Ash All right. So next dinner party or next cold day, um, get yourself. And whatever dregs you have, if you have dregs of another type of liquor, throw it in. That's really what they do. Whatever's the, la the last finger, the last half a finger of uh, uh, liquor in whatever bottle they have, they throw it together. All right, Cafe Moretta. A little out of order, that's all right. It'll give me energy for our next one. All right, get all this stuff out of here. We're going to start the, uh, the Pazza Norcina in just a couple of minutes, and we're going to turn it back to the beautiful Ashmeister who will – what are you going to be talking about, Ashley? Upcoming classes. Upcoming classes. Excellent. All right, very good. All right, see you in two minutes. A little go Hawks first off. Um, I saw some people wrote some great comments after uh, my little uh, segment over here, and I'm freaking excited. It is the second time in franchise history for the Seahawks to be going to the Super Bowl. So people might be thinking, why does this girl in Italy keep talking about the Seahawks or have a poster behind her? I love Seattle. I'm a homer through and through. I love Italy, and if any of you who have um, been guests here know, once you get out here, you know, I love Italy and the market and showing this beautiful area. And then once you're here, I'll ask, have you been to Seattle? So I am just so um, overjoyed <laughs> with our football team this year. Anyway, what is really going on here in Italy? So now that you know the forecast is supposed to be gorgeous for this spring and summer, you guys should start planning your trips to Italy. Whether you come out to see us or another park, um, obviously the weather's going to be good. But in the meantime... Let's talk about some of the upcoming cooking classes we have going on. So, we'll be taking some time off with football, as I just mentioned, and the next class will be February 16th. That class is going to be, this one's a little controversial, a little bunny foo-foo hopping onto your plate. So we're doing rabbit and hunter style. You could also do chicken if you're not a huge rabbit fan. But since these are cooking classes, I just strongly suggest that you go outside your box, try something different, and give it a go. I mean, if, you, if you've thought about rabbit before or, or you never thought about it, this is the perfect opportunity because you're not doing it alone. Jason's here. He's going to help you through the steps, and it's so delicious, I wouldn't lie to you. We didn't steer you on with the uh, chicken fegatini, or the <laughs> chicken fegatini, the crostini fegatini, the chicken liver crostini, or the whole fish, so trust us with the rabbit. It's going to be just... Um, succulent and absolutely delicious. And this also, when you hear rabbit in the style of the hunter or a la cacciatore, cacciatore just means hunter. So when you're talking, we'll get into this obviously much more for that um, class as well, but when you're talking about something in the style of the hunter, just like this Cafe Fanese uh, or La Moretta, it changes all over Italy, which is one of the beauties of traveling to Italy. So in our area, we use a uh, cacciatore recipe which has vinegar and uh, white wine vinegar, and it pulls out the flavor and the, um, the juiciness, whereas many people associate cacciatore with a red sauce, so like tomato-based, and that's not this at all. So, give it a go, it's something different. How are you looking, Jay? I'm ready. All right, he's ready. He said, stretch it out, talk long. He doesn't know how long I could talk, so <laughs> we will switch it back over to him right now. Hold on, hold on. Ready? Yep. 
All right, here we go. Pasta alla Norcina from Norcia, which is named after a Norcino. Uh, Norcino, the old way, the uh, word for a pig butcher. And this um, very, very simple sauce. This is a sauce that you can make while you're waiting for the pasta water to cook. And um, this isn't done with uh, handmade. Usually it's not done with handmade pasta. It's done with short pasta from the box. I've got Barilla Pene Regatta. It's, it's one that you make when you come home when you come home on a Wednesday night for dinner, and uh, it takes five minutes. So, because it's from a, uh, come on, come on. All right, that guy doesn't want a light. Excuse me one second. Just, no, all right, we'll put him right there. This is live, no kidding. Okay, there we go. Now I got my pasta water going. Okay. I don't know why that one didn't want to work. Oh, it was off the thing. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Okay, so what do I have? A carrot, medium carrot, right? I got a clove of garlic and a little bit of sausage meat. We just made sausages, so I have uh, meat from two sausages from upstairs that are hanging to dry. If you don't want to use pork sausage meat, use turkey sausage meat. Use something else. It's just a little bit of something fatty and something salty to go in there. Okay, to start it off, I'm going to put my pan onto very low heat with a couple of glugs of olive oil. What do I mean by glugs? Well, I don't really like to write recipes by telling you it's two tablespoons or four tablespoons or whatever. It's a couple of glugs, man. It, you don't pour half a bottle and you don't pour a half a teaspoon. You pour one, two, three, four. And if I had the big pot, I'd go glug, 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 glug. Yep, so right into the pot there. So, four, four or so glugs of olive oil. Clove of garlic. Here we leave the garlic whole because we're going to remove it at the end because we don't want the very um, pungent taste of the garlic to be eaten. All right? And you can see when I put my garlic in, it's not popping, it's not spitting, it's not doing anything crazy. It's, we're just going to lightly, lightly sweat the garlic on all sides. You can either remove it before we put the onions in or leave it in with the onions. It really... It really doesn't matter, whatever your preference. All right, we're going to light the burner that I really wanted to light in the first place. There we go. Hot cam, look at that. All right. Now we're going. All right, as soon as I hear that start to sizzle and pop, the garlic, I'm going to shut the heat off because we're going to peel our carrots. Now, this is not a, this is not a ton of carrot, and it, you cannot cut the carrots big because... The carrots should really just kind of melt into the sauce. If we cut our carrots really big, they're, it's going to be odd. We talked about mouthfeel last week. The way you cut vegetables has a very large impact on how they taste because how they feel in your mouth. All right, so my garlic's doing its thing. I'm going to shut that off. So, no, I didn't mention onion. There's no onion in this dish. Okay. Uh, carrot. So we have a peeled carrot. I'm going to cut it into two pieces because it's easier for me to handle. Just like we did with the onion, I want, to cut a, um, I want to cut a flat surface. So I'm just going to cut a little flat surface. This you can eat or chop up later or compost it. Next thing, I want to cut strips. See how I'm down and forward? See how I'm cutting strips? Now when you get to the end, when you can't hold that anymore, lay it down, flat, always flat surfaces, and cut strips again. See what I got? Now, now, these long strips, I'm going to want to make into sticks. Strips into sticks, sticks into tiny pieces. The closer you make your cuts and the smaller you cut your sticks, the thinner you cut your sticks, the smaller your end result will be. All right? Very important knife skills, right? Very important. Okay? So I've got all my carrots piled up together. Now, if this is too much for you to hold, put, do it into two different parts. Right? Now, with the, with the knife, I'm going to go down and forward and cut tiny little pieces. Check it out. See how small? Really, really important, guys. I would not have you do this just because I think cutting tiny, tiny pieces of carrot is super fun. There's a method behind the madness. And this is the little things that make a difference. So check it out. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Different, much different from if I did something like this. This is more for soup. Look at the difference. 
Now, some of you might say, well, that's my small, right? Look at the difference in the sizing. That's for soup. This is for this dish, right? Totally, totally two different cuts. It makes a difference. Now, if you have your onions, or I'm sorry, if you have your carrot, more like the first one right here, how do we fix that? Super easy. Take the knife in your hand, hand on top of the knife, right? Don't, just with the, just a little pressure, just to make it so it doesn't move all over the place, and just go up and down. There's no, there's no um, person standing over you with a millimeter ruler making sure each piece is actually the same size, but they need to be kind of small, right? They don't have to all be equal squares, right? But they need to be small. So check out, even though I cut big ones to begin with, I just run my knife through it. And now more or less, you, can have, you have what I have. Knife skills, huge part of cooking. Everyone wants this shortcut and the tricks and the tips and all that kind of stuff. Here's a trip and a, here's a really good trip and tip. Trip and tip. Here's a really good trick and tip. Learn how to use a knife. There's no, there's no I can't, I, you can't fake learning how to use a knife. The more you get proficient in using a knife, the more enjoyment you will have in the kitchen because this is the work part. This is the fun part. That's the work. Okay. I am going to do um, knife skills on the 16th, a little, little knife skill kind of um, break in between, knife care and all that kind of stuff. So I have my, my um, chopped uh, uh, carrot. I only used half of that carrot. I don't need all the carrot. Remember, it is not a, it's not carrots with pasta. All right, back on nice and low heat, goes back on my um, pan. Let me switch these to this down. Yes, my pasta is not in the water yet, right? Pasta takes 10 minutes to cook. I'm going to do a lot of talking. Now, once we drop in the sausage meat, then my pasta will go in, okay? If I was doing this just by myself, as soon as that garlic goes in, the pasta goes in because I know I can make this sauce. 10 minutes, no problem. All right, heat back on, uh, low, medium, medium, low heat, right? Then my garlic clove, I'll leave it in because I like the garlic. If you want to take the garlic clove out at this point, that's totally up to you. On, or carrots go in. Check it out. Do the yep. Do the carrot? The carrots are not spitting. They're not popping. They're not cracking. They're not going crazy. The pan heat is low. We do not want to. I do not want to brown these carrots. Right? That is not. That is not very nice. Brown carrot. We just want to simply sweat them. We talked about sweating a couple of weeks ago. The difference between sweating and sautéing. This is sweating. We are trying to cook out some of the liquid in the pan to concentrate the flavor of the carrots. All right. Does anyone have any questions about sweating versus sautéing? So I can go through that for a minute before we move on to the next step. All right. I'll just talk about it. Listen to your pan. We cook with our eyes, with our ears, with our nose, with our mouth. The, the pan will make, oh, there's our veggies. I'll do it after I spiel. Uh, the pan will let you know. When you put the onions or you put the garlic in, if the pan starts spitting and popping, there's a difference in sound between these, the garlic and the, and the carrots frying and sweating. Sweating will have a wet sound to it, almost a gurgle as it cooks. Frying will have a snap, crackle, pop. Okay? This is sweating. You can also see, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but you can see the water vapor, the, uh, the, the water vapor coming up off the pan. The more of water vapor that comes up, the better because we're cooking out the um, moisture out of the carrots. If you were frying these, you would not see water vapor coming out. The water vapor would go away. And you can definitely hear the difference. Electric versus gas. I'm sorry, it sucks. I, I feel bad for, for those of you with electric ranges out here right now. You have to control your heat better because your heat doesn't respond as quickly. So I would just let the pan, make sure your pans heat up more because it's going to take longer for the, uh, the electric element to heat up. So make sure you're patient with your pans. And just remember, if you get your pan too hot, your electric element does not, um, does not cool down as fast. So you're going to have to do a lot more removing the pan from the burner. Okay? Remember, once you remove the pan from the burner, it doesn't matter what the burner is doing. The pan starts cooling down immediately. All right. Pepperoncino. If you want cracked black pepper or if you want, I like a little crushed red pepper flakes. I like a lot of crushed red pepper flakes. Okay, once the carrot has just started to soften, and you can go ahead and just give it a taste, see if it's starting to soften or if it's still crunchy. 
Garlic is right there. You can remove the, like I said before, you can remove the garlic right now, or you can leave it in and just remove it at the end. It's totally up to you. All right, my carrots have another couple of minutes, so let's talk about the other ingredients. We talked about sausage meat, uh, about, and you, you use sweet, fennel, um, uh, other flavorings, chicken sausage, turkey sausage, whatever, whatever you want, about two sausage links worth. And this is going to feed about four people. A nice handful of grated Parmesan or Pecorino or whatever kind of hard grated cheese you want. Cream. Now, here traditionally they use Pana per la Cucina. Pana per la Cucina is a um, shelf-stable little carton that looks like um, long life milk, but it's very tiny. And it's basically a bechamel or cream that's it's used for cooking. It's full of garbage. It's full of preservatives. It's, it's, milk that can, it's cream that can sit on the shelves, for God's sake. So we're going to do the same thing. We're by just reducing cream. Now, if you wanted to stay away from all the fat of cream, totally cool. Go ahead and make yourself a bechamel with whole milk, but make it loose. Make it a nice, loose bechamel. You'll add the bechamel in when we add the cream in, and you just won't have to reduce the sauce like I will. Because this is cream, I have to reduce it to get it to thicken up. But for four people, we're using a half a cup of cream, or um, what did I, half a cup or 125 milliliters. It's not a ton, but it is one that has a little bit more fat in it. It's winter time, baby. It's comfort food. We gotta pack on. We gotta make sure that we're uh, have enough energy to live out the winter. Yes. Okay. So, my my uh, carrots are soft now. How are your are your carrots ready? Because I'm gonna drop my pasta. Should I uh, wait two seconds before I drop my pasta? Maybe I'll spiel about pasta water. One of the main mistakes that we make as North Americans is we don't cook our pasta in enough water. I'm going, to cook, I'm going to cook one box of pasta. I have a giant pot of water going with a little bit of salt. Okay? The salt does two things. It raises the temperature of the boiling water. So instead of boiling at 100, 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, maybe I get two more degrees higher. Why does that make a difference? And I'm removing my, I'm removing my carrots because I'm talking. Why does that make a difference? Because when you dump the pasta in, that's two degrees closer to bringing back to the, coming back up to the boil that you'll be. The quicker you can get your pasta to the boil, the better you'll have a chance of it getting being al dente and not mushy. All right. I know my veggies, woo, my veggies uh, went ahead and they uh, beeped a couple of seconds ago. Here's my veggies. Now, okay. You can see the ones around the, uh, the, ones around the vegetables have gotten a little bit too dark, but the ones on top of the vegetables are not dark at all. You can see my, my veggies are nice and soft. They're cooked, but they're not brown. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to leave the temperature at the same thing, um, 180, 180 or 350, and I'm just going to kick the fan on. What the fan does is it moves the air all around, and it'll, it'll brown everything up. If you don't have a fan, that's fine. Leave them in the, leave them in the um, oven at the same temperature, and the last five minutes or so, turn the broiler on. Just stand over it and brown up the vegetables. All righty. No, the broiler is like the grill. The fan is the convection fan in your oven. No, you would not turn on your broiler now. If you have a broiler and not the fan, the last two minutes, if they need a little bit of color, turn on your broiler. If not, then just leave them at 350 until another 20 minutes or so until they're really starting to look like they're, they're nice and cooked, and then broiler for two minutes. Don't walk away from it. Don't just turn on your broiler and take off. They will burn. <laughs> For those of you with a convection fan, kick your convection fan on, and it'll be 15 more minutes, and they'll be done. What about, the what about burning the parchment? That's a great question. Parchment does not really burn that easy. It, you have to really pull the fire to parchment. If you have the broil, if you have the vegetables half an inch away or two centimeters away from the um, element, yes, you might catch it on fire. But that's the beauty of parchment. It'll turn color. It'll get black, but it won't burn. Okay. Now, since I talked, my pan is not hot enough. So I'm going to turn up the heat a little bit so we were on a low heat. Now we'll go to medium low, and we're going to add in our sausage meat, and at the same time, drop our pasta. Ten minutes. See ya. So lots of pasta water. For can never have too much pasta water, right? In goes, in goes our sausage meat. See, not a lot of it. Check it out. It's not a ton. Now, with the back of a fork, we're going to start to mush up the sausage. As it cooks, it'll be easier and easier to crumble. But now that it's raw, it doesn't really do it that easy. Not a ton of sausage meat, right? This isn't um, 
just like hamburger helper style. In fact, <laughs> Ashley put up a picture of this dish the other day on, I forget what side it was, it doesn't matter. Someone commented it looks like great hamburger helper. So, all right. It's the best hamburger helper you'll ever have. How's that? All right, pasta's back up to the boil. Excellent. Now, woo, we won't use that one. Um, what other pastas? What other pastas can you use with this? What other pastas can you use with this? You can use any short pasta. So that's your rigatoni, your panne, your uh, we use spruzzo pretti. I use um, sometimes I'll do gnocchi with this. Uh, any other ones? Uh, just nothing. You don't want to use like a spaghetti. It just doesn't go with spaghetti. Orchietti it will go with anything sh nice and short. All right, pan is too hot now. So you can see I make adjustments in my pan because I kicked it up a little bit too high. I noticed that um, the uh, I saw that the um, carrots are starting to brown a little bit, so I turn it down. Make adjustments. Constantly make adjustments. Yep, what is strozzo pretti? Strozzo pretti are a traditional Marcagiani pasta called strozzo pretti or strangled priests. The um, lore has it that uh, there's a saying that you'd rather have death at your door than a Marcagiani because they were tax collectors for the Vatican. So if you had a Marcagiani at your door, you knew that they wanted money. Um, I'd rather have death at your door than a Marcagiani. So um, I don't know, I guess the ladies of, ladies of the Le Marque or, or from a surrounding area did this uh, uh, pasta called Strangled Priests, and they, they, can get their, they can get their anger out for paying taxes to the Vatican by strangling the priests. Normally, I would serve strozza pretti with this. I just, I like it with it. Or, or I'll, I'll also serve the gnocchi, or if it's just me, if it's just the two of us, I'll just do um, boxed pasta. But if you come to our house for dinner and I serve you beautiful homemade sausage strozza pretti, you won't get the box sauce. How's that? Or the box pasta. Okay, next thing goes your cream. Now, if you're going to use a bechamel made from milk, you wouldn't have to reduce. But we're going to put in our cream. Turn up the heat. There we go. And we're going to let this reduce. Okay? So you can see, for four people, it's not a ton of meat. It's not a ton of, of also of uh, cream. What we're going to do is we're going to make our um, uh, sauce uh, with a little bit of the with the pot, a little bit of the pasta water that the pasta cooked in, and some of the cheese, the Parmesan cheese, to bind everything together. A lot of sauces in Italy, these quick moment sauces, do this. They take cheese, pasta water, and the pasta in the same pan. I'm going to take the pasta directly from the pot to the pan. I'm not going to dump it in the sink. I have. One of these guys, and it's going to go directly from the from the pot to the pan. Now, if you don't have one of those and you're going to dump it into a uh, pasta strainer, totally fine. Just save aside a glass of the pasta water because we're going to need that to thin out the sauce, right? So all we're looking to do is get this sauce so it'll coat the back of the spoon, right? So you can see it's not quite there yet, but almost. And it's usually if you reduce it by half. Now, my cream here is much lighter. It's much doesn't have as much milk of fat in it as cream that I'm used to in the States. If you, I've noticed if you go up north, the cream is heavier. Here, I have very light cream. So yours might already be done uh, um, reducing. I don't know. Once it's done reducing, mine's 20 seconds away, shut the heat off. All right? We'll wait for the pasta. When the pasta's cooked, we'll turn the heat back on, add the pasta to the pot with a little bit of the pasta water and the cheese, and we'll, and we'll adjust seasonings from there. So it all depends upon your cream, whether you're using the bechamel or the straight cream, and how much you're cooking for. I can make this dish for four people or for 40. It really doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the amounts of everything. But instead of using half a carrot, I'll use 10 carrots and, and three liters of cream. You know, it, you can really make a lot of this. All right, so my guy's done. Questions? Oh, kids would love this is this is right up kids alley. This is as close to um, Alfredo as you'll ever see because this is real. There's no, I don't know. I think Alfredo is like an American kind of concoction. There is no, I've never seen Alfredo here, but this is as about as around the Alfredo as you'll really get. Okay. Mm. That coffee is good. All right. Check my pasta. Not even close. 
Okay, so I'm, I had my sauce shut off. You can see here how it's cooked down. And it's not a ton, right? We're not going to drown this pasta in sauce. We're not going to put a ton of um, meat in it either. Yes, hit me, Ashley. Is the sausage supposed to be fully cooked before adding the cream? The sausage is, the sausage is supposed to be fully cooked before adding the cream. I just look for no red in it. As long as there's not a lot of red going on as I'm mushing it up, it's going to reduce down in the cream another three or four minutes. So three quarters of the way or all cooked is fine. As soon as I stop seeing red, in goes the cream. All right. Any other questions? How are you guys doing? What's good? Is your pasta almost there? You can see how you can really literally have dinner on the table in the amount of time it takes for pasta to cook. All right, two minutes. All right, let's check out our... Oh, very nice. So you, you can see on the edges, it's starting to get nice and dark. Okay. My oven's too hot. So I'm going to turn my oven down a little bit because it's starting to burn. But that's what we want to see. The edges to start to get brown and the tops to uh, the edges to start to get golden, and soon the tops will be right behind it. I want to turn these guys down. My oven's just been funky. I need a new thermostat in my oven stack. Yes, Ashley. Um, if someone has a large piece and um, they took it out of the sauce, if someone is allergic to. If, if someone is allergic to cheese, can, do they, can they keep it out of the sauce? Absolutely. Leave the cheese out. It's, uh, Ash, I need this camera. Oh, sorry. Uh, leave, the cheese out, leave the cheese out. It's no big deal at all. Just go ahead and no, don't add as much wa pasta water and let the cream kind of coat the, uh, coat the pasta. Um, we're really adding cheese to kind of get the, get the uh, pasta water and the cream to kind of come together. You'll see the cheese acts as a little bit of binder. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and maybe... If I'm going to add uh, a third of a ladle, you add a spoonful of water instead of a third of a ladle. All right, let's see how we're doing. I'm probably pretty sure it's done. All right, yes, now, it's to the tooth or al dente. I don't want to cook it till it's mush or cooked cooked in here because it's going to continue to cook in the pan. What's the theory? Why are we doing this? Why are we, instead of draining it into the pot, into the sink, why are we putting it directly in the pan? What I want the pasta to do is to continue to cook. As it continues to cook, it's going to want to suck up liquid. In the pot, it's sucking up water. In here, it's going to suck up my sauce. So you continue to have the pasta cook in the pan, it'll suck up your sauce, and you'll see how your pasta will have a totally different taste. Why we just dump pasta on a plate and then dump sauce on top of it, I have no idea. All right, here we go. Yeah, we can switch if you want. Okay, ladle. Pasta, just let it drain out and go right into you'll never get I mean, there's always one or two stragglers, they go to the chickens. Alright, for the most part that's it. Okay, I'm gonna give it a little toss. See how we're looking? You can see at the bottom of the pan, at no time do I ever want the bottom of the pan to go dry. Mm. So, third of a ladle or so of water, medium heat, we're going to stir the pasta together. In goes our cheese. Not a ton, right? You can always put more cheese on at the end. Now, as, the, as this continues to cook, the pasta is going to continue to suck up the liquid. If it gets too dry, add more water. Oh, there's my garlic clove. It's just us. All right, there's my garlic clove. Okay, there it is. I'm shutting it off. Heat's off. You can see that there's still a little bit of moisture in the bottom of the pan, but for the most part, everything's nicely coated. All right, let's taste. We're, we're tasting for salt and pepper, basically. It doesn't need salt. It needs a crack of pepper. Now, if this sits on the stove like this for another minute, you're going to have to add more water because the pasta is going to continue to suck up liquid. If you just leave it, um, if you leave it on a pan too long, it will just become one piece of pasta. So if I talk for 30 more seconds, I'm going to add another spoonful of water, mix it in, and let the pasta absorb that up. So this is why we take the pasta out when it's really al dente. If this was to your taste, you would probably say it's two minutes from being cooked which is actually 
True, because it went in the pan for two minutes. All right, let's plate. So Ashley says I pile all my, I usually keep my, all my uh, plates and everything on the stove because the, the uh, stove is warm to warm the plates up. It's cold in the kitchen. But she says it makes it look messy, so I will agree with her. Okay, so to serve, just a little bit in a nice pretty bowl. Yep. Okay. A little in a nice pretty bowl. You can put a little more cheese. I know everyone likes a little cheese on top. Clean yourself up. Okay. And next, let's get out our the Dori Gratinata. Oh, yes, that's done. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, my, my breadcrumbs got burned because my thermostat does not work properly. So when I put my temperature on, it's not even close. Looks like I will be replacing that one this weekend. Or next weekend, sorry. Okay, so here they go. Plate them right there. Beautiful baked vegetables in the oven. And we are, like I said, these recipes are not of my own. These are things that have been passed, thankfully passed down to me from our wonderful neighbors and friends. And uh, I just want to bring this to you. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very, very, very simple. All you need to do is get the best possible ingredients you can and be technically sound, have good technique. Make sure that you cook your pasta properly. Make sure you don't burn your carrots when you're cooking them. Make sure that you don't drown your vegetables in olive oil and then put too much breadcrumbs. It's all about the little things, and that's really what I want to drive home here. Like I said before, I can get any monkey to repeat, just to ver repeat verbatim w the recipes that I'm showing you, but I want you to learn something, right? I want you to learn not what to make, but how to make it, and that's what's most important. All right. I hope, I hope yours came out as well as mine did. I've done this once or twice before, so it's a lot easier for me, but this is it. If you made a mistake, think, why, where did I go wrong? Did I add too much pasta? Did I add too much water to the pasta when it was cooking? Did I have to cook it out too much and my pasta went, saw it and my pasta went overcooked? Did I have, is it too salty? Did I add too much salt? Did I not add too much salt? Taste. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, all these five senses, very important when you cook. All right, we will be back in, we're going to take a two-week break for the Super Bowl, and we will be back to you, what day, Ashley? 19th, or 16th of, 16th of February, and um, you can find all the information at www.latavolamarque.com, or send us an, uh, an email, info at latavolamarque.com, and from our beautiful, our beautiful home in lovely, Marque. Ashley, any questions? She's typing away furiously, so <laughs> she's typing away furiously, so I can't stop. Oh, okay. She doesn't have a question. So, very good. Uh, email any of your photos. We can put up photos on Instagram, or if you have any questions after the fact, we're here. We are connected by these crazy, this crazy internet, so the world is very small. Email your photos, your questions. Um, I, I'm going to kick it back to Ashley here in just one minute. She's going to give out our Instagram so you can put up your pictures and share them with the other people taking the class. And this is what we really try to do. We're all in this, all in this crazy, less, all in this crazy cooking class together. And I couldn't be more grateful for you signing on. So thank you very much. I'm going to kick it back to Ashley and I, Bon Appetito. Enjoy what you've made. I hope you learned something today. I was uh, feverishly typing away to some of your questions and whatnot, so I wasn't really listening to the last part, Jason. <laughs> so I'll just uh, kind of bring it all back home again anyway. Um, thank you guys, like you said, for tuning in. Thanks, and and uh, you can find us. Oh, please, if you're taking pictures along the way, um, tag us um, at La Table Marque or do a little hashtag <laughs> La Table Marque or live from Italy and post it on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. And uh, we'll be reposting those pictures. It's really fun to see what you guys have created and how beautiful your dishes have come out as well. And, um, and just to kind of see the shot of uh, Jason in your kitchen, it's a wild for us. Uh, anything else you can add? No. I know you did a really good job bringing it home. <laughs> so Thank you. Until next time, arrivederci from our piccolo, from our little farmhouse in Italy. We'll see you next time, February 16th. You can 
email me at info at metabolamarket.com. And to stay up to date on any of the menus, schedules, for our cooking classes live from Italy, dot, uh, live from Italy online, dot, tumblr, dot com. I'm going to send you guys the link right now. Thank you so much, and uh, alla prossima. Until next time.